are kicking off tonight what for me is my favorite time of year every year at our Young Adult Ministry because we are launching our brand new relationship series tonight. Um, some of you, like, you're like, that's why I'm here. Like, we haven't seen you in months. You're back. Welcome. Welcome back. Um, and you're like, what is Citizen YA? Like, maybe you haven't been here in a minute. Um, but anyway, I, I love this, and I love talking about this. Now, I'm going to let you guys know, the, the way that I get to preach, and my, my brother's going to be teaching this series, and we've got a, a, a panel that we're going to have in, in the coming weeks, and we're going to answer some crazy questions. Um, but what I love about teaching about relationships in this environment is I can say things in here, and I can, I can speak specifically to things to you guys that I, like, wouldn't say on a Sunday, Okay. I'm gonna get a little bit more real, a little bit more weird, a little bit more awkward in here. Um, and what I love is I'm talking to a bunch of people. Some, some of you are married, there's just a few, um, but a lot of people who are not married yet, um, which is exciting because so much of what you can learn in this series can like change the trajectory of the rest of your life. Um, if you are married, you know, and I'm telling these dating, by people dating, like you should break up and get out. Like if you're married, it's like, <laughs> you're stuck. But like, um, you guys don't have that, right? You have it in front of you and it's like, there's, there's so much wide open space and um, I wanna ask this question just to see what we're working with. How many of you guys would raise your hand? Let's keep them up in the air. Um, you are single, and what I mean by that is you're not married. Let me see how many hands. You're not married. Hold them up. Okay, now we built this auditorium for this moment because you can see people, right? So just gauge, you know, across the auditorium. You can see them, right? That's why it's a circle like that, and uh, I think a connection was just made. Like, I saw it. It was pretty cool. Um, anyway, if you guys date and have a kid, you can name him Brandon because I helped you out. Uh, there we go. Okay, never mind. So anyway, um, I love this, and, and tonight we're, we're launching our, our series. We've had the best series titles, I think, with this. I mean, we've done Netflix and Chill, and we did Tinder Hearted, but like, like the Tinder icon, and we've done all kinds of great stuff. And uh, this, tonight, this week, we're launching our new series called Cuffing Season. Everybody say Cuffing Season. Now, I think a lot of you in here will know what that means. I think uh, the, the struggling demographic would be like where I am, like the 25s to 30s are like, what does this mean? But um, cuffing season, if you don't know, let me give you a quick definition from the Urban Dictionary, um, which means that it's official, it means this, it's during the fall and winter months, people who would normally rather be single or promiscuous find themselves along with the rest of the world desiring to be cuffed or tied down by a serious relationship. The cold weather and prolonged indoor activity causes singles to become lonely and desperate to be cuffed. Have you seen this happen? Is it happening to you? It might be. We're in, we're, we're like full swing. We're in cuffing season. I read this like list. It was like a whole uh, calendar of like, and right now we're in like the scouting and drafting season. And so we're looking, right? And then basically what you're supposed to do is you're supposed to date this person through the holidays, Christmas, and then, uh, and then you get to um, Valentine's Day. And then after that, if you want to break up, you can. So like that's kind of apparently how this works. I'm not saying that's good advice. I'm just saying Urban Dictionary. It's what I read. Um, my favorite thing was one Sunday, my dad, um, was quoting something. He preaches here on Sundays, and he used the Urban Dictionary. I don't think he knew what he was doing. Um, it was just the best thing in the world. So, so every year for the past eight years, um, as, as I've been like leading this ministry, we've done a relationship series, and, um, and, and we're gonna do it every year because it's just it's so important. And we want you guys, um, whether or not you think you're gonna get married or not, and we'll talk about this like real statistics in the coming weeks, what I know about you, and you may not know about this about yourself, but what I've read about our age group and our generation is that most of you will still get married. And you might be sitting here like, no, I'm not. You, you might, though. You probably will. It's just most of us are saying we don't want to, but we still are getting married really at the same rate just a little bit later. And, and my desire for you guys, because I think who you marry is so incredibly important to your future and just you loving life and enjoying life and doing everything that God has called you to do, I want you to get married well. But you will not get married well if you don't date well, okay? There's a starting point. And I want to talk about dating, and we do this because in this age group, it's kind of what we're, we're obsessed with, right? We, we do things, and we, we're hanging out with crowds, and we, we try to get, you know, squeeze ourselves into groups, and we, we linger after services, and all of it is built around, like, we're looking for somebody. We're looking for that person that we're trying to mingle with. And, and so we want to talk about dating because if I can be honest with you, as I've watched this, I've watched myself date poorly at times, and and I've watched people date over the last eight years, and I've watched some of you date. Um, by and large, generally speaking, I think that we are pretty bad at it. Would you guys agree? Have you been on the other end of that? Have you been the problem, right? Like, so um, we're, somebody's like shooting their hand up, like I, it was me, I know. Um, but we're not honestly all that good at dating. And I'm like, man, I think we should get better at this. Like, we don't know what the heck we're doing. And, and I don't think anybody here is, 
is bad and is trying to hurt people, but when we don't know what we're doing, when we don't have a plan and a vision for dating, and we don't know God's best for this, we're gonna end up getting hurt and we're gonna hurt other people along the way. And I don't think that's what God wants for us. I think we can date, I even think we can break up and still handle these things in a way that honors God and honors that other person. And so those are things that we wanna um, cover in the next uh, few weeks. And you know, I was, I was thinking about this this morning. Um, I took, this will be a little random for a second, but it'll all come together hopefully. Um, I took driver's ed 15 years ago, okay? When I was 15 years old, um, how many of you have ever taken driver's ed before? Yes? Okay, good. That's okay. Most of you. Um, hopefully you're driving legally. So you took driver's ed. And uh, do any of you guys mess with the driver's ed cars when you see them? Do any of you guys do that? Let me see. Just where are you at? Okay. These are bad people, guys. Okay. Um, but I took driver's ed when I was 15 years old. And, um, and I remember the way that we did it, I don't know how it works anymore, but we got, you know, we, we watched some uh, videos. We watched Red Asphalt. And I was like scared of life. Um, and then after that, we, we got in a car. And uh, it was me, this other guy from my, he was part of my school, so I knew him from school, he was on my football team, and our driving instructor. And so I hopped in the driver's seat, I was up first, I was driving this tiny little like Kia, and uh, he was in the, pass, or the passenger seat, the driving instructor, and then this guy named Ben was in the back seat. And so I go for like an hour, I'm driving, and I did pretty well. I think I got like a 90 on the test, I hit a few curbs, but I still do that today, so like, it is what it is. I take tight turns, people. Um, and so I did pretty well, and then uh, all of a sudden, my, like I got on the interstate, I, did, I, I merged at 30 miles an hour, but like I did it. I was on the interstate, got off the interstate, and I was done. And the driving instructor was like, hey, good job. Um, you can go ahead and hop in the back seat, put your seatbelt on, and he brought Ben up to the front. Now, um, I was immediately concerned because I know Ben, I know him, and I play football with Ben, and Ben was one of the most unathletic, uncoordinated kids you've ever seen in your life. And I was worried about riding in a car with Ben because Ben couldn't even run in a straight line. Like, I kid you not, we would line up for sprints, like at the end of practice, the coach would line us up, and we would run down, back, down, back, like maybe eight times, and he'd be right next to me. And by the end of sprints, he was like 17 people down. And I'm like, how did you get over there? How is that? He's just zigzagging, just can't run a straight line. And I get in the back seat, and this guy's driving the car. He's driving the little Kia, and I'm like, okay, God, let's see how this goes. And immediately, it started going exactly how I had feared that it would go. And we're driving through a neighborhood and Ben is barreling down on parked cars. And the, like, the instructor's grabbing the wheel, he's like whipping this thing around, he's using his brake, and I'm just in the back seat holding on. And I'm like, God, like I didn't wanna die at 15. Like this was, like I thought you had more for me, you know? And, and before the song even came out, I'm just, came out, I'm just singing Jesus take the wheel like in the back seat. And I was just terrified for my life. And we, the funniest part of this, was we get to the part where he's supposed to go on the interstate and the coach was like, yeah, you know what, time's up. Like, we're not, he didn't want to risk his life either. I was grateful to know I wasn't the only one. Now, um, it could go without saying, Ben did not pass his driving test. Um, and he didn't pass the two after that either. Like, I don't know to this day if he drives. I really don't. I'm gonna look him up on Facebook and just maybe ask him. Um, but he doesn't, he doesn't, he, passed, he filled his test and our instructor who was, um, you know, solid, like certified by the state of New Mexico decided this guy is not fit to be on the road. Like there was a certain level of, of testing and these certain qualifications that he needed to have that he didn't possess. And so we were like, we can't let this guy on the road. Otherwise he's gonna be a hazard to himself and to the drivers throughout the state of New Mexico. Be grateful that Ben didn't pass that test, guys. Now here's what I find to be really kind of crazy and honestly kind of sad. It is, think about this. We live in a world today where it is harder to get a driver's license than it is to get a marriage license. So even once you pass your driving test, hopefully you did, have, have any of you guys gotten a license in the past three or four years? Like the amount of things you have to bring, I had to go home four times because I couldn't remember what to bring. And they wanted every piece of documentation I've ever collected in my entire life. They're like, do you have your receipts from 1999? I was like, I'm not sure. You know, like, let me check. Um, and so I'm coming back and it, it costs a lot of money. And the funniest thing is uh, seven years ago, my wife and I, we go um, to get our marriage certificate, our marriage license, and all we had to do, we go to the city clerk, we handed her our social security card numbers, not even our IDs, just social security card, like, card, and paid the lady 25 bucks. She said, that'd be 25 bucks. We're like, okay, and then she handed the certificate. She's like, congratulations, good luck, go get married. You know, like, we walked out, and it just kind of blew my mind that we live in a society where if someone is not fit to drive, we won't let them drive, yet we live in a society where if someone's not fit to date, we'll still let them date. And many of you will date them, <laughs> you know? So, and, I, and, and many of you have dated someone like that. 
and, and you're on the other end right now of some hurt and some difficulty because you dated somebody that you never should have dated. Maybe you're in that right now. And I wanna help you through this series. And I, I say it every time, every year, some of you guys know it's coming, but, um, and I, I used to say it really lightly and jokingly, but it kind of hurts a lot of people, so I'm gonna be nice this time. Um, if, if throughout this series, if you're in a relationship and you kind of have that realization, this is not the right relationship, I wanna encourage you to get out of that relationship. It's okay to break up. It's okay if you, you're sitting next to him right now and like your heart's pounding and you're like, oh my God, like we probably should break up. Like if you're feeling that, listen to that. Don't do it right now. Like honestly, it'd be so weird. But like after service, take him to Applebee's, half off apps, like it's a cheap meal, do the damage there. You know what I'm saying? Um, somebody's getting invited to Applebee's later and be like, no, I'm not. <laughs> but I want us to understand that if we're gonna take the time to make sure that we're ready to drive, I want us to take the time to make sure that we're ready to date so that we're not a danger to ourselves, we're not a danger to people around us. I want you to do it well, I do. I wanna, I wanna see people in, in the church date differently than people that are not inside of the church. I want Christians to do this differently with a lot more grace, with a lot more love, with a lot more respect, with a lot more purity, and that's kinda where I wanna go uh, over these next few weeks. Now, the, the last thing I wanna say on this is that um, this series is gonna build on itself. And so if you come tonight, you miss like the next two weeks and then show up, um, I mean, that's okay. I'm not gonna like be mad at you or anything, but I think you're gonna miss a lot of important keys. I'm gonna hit a few things tonight. Like this sermon, the one that I wrote initially was like probably two hours long. And I was like, we can't, nobody wants that. So, but what, what I want you to know is that there's so much that we wanna talk about and so much that we wanna include that that's what we're gonna do over the next four to five weeks. And I, I want you to be here each week so this can build on itself. And so tonight in a moment, I'm gonna talk about what are we looking for? What type of person should we be looking for in dating? Next week, I wanna talk about dating. Like, how do we date well? How do we do this where we don't end up in these ridiculous mini marriages and when we break up, it feels like a divorce because ultimately what we're doing is we're just practicing how to get divorced later in life. And, and so I wanna address all these things with you guys, but um, dating in a moment, okay? So in the cave, listen to me for a second. In a moment, I want them to put up this, uh, this definition, but we've used the same definition for the last, like, four years here. Does anybody know? I've, I've got a Red Bull. I'm not just going to drink this, okay? Like, um, does anybody know how we define dating here at Citizen YA? Does anybody know? Other than, like, our staff? Okay. Is there a hand? Does somebody? Okay. Shout it out if you know it. Evaluate. That's close enough. I'm going to give him, okay, there you go. Give him a big hand. You can have that Red Bull. Chug that thing. Okay. So, now they can put up the definition. Dating is a process of evaluation, the least sexy definition you're ever gonna hear about dating. Like I thought dating was dates and butterflies and spending money, you know, and kissing a lot and like all those things. And those things can be involved, sure. Um, but dating ultimately is a process of evaluation. And I think if you're dating well, you're not just getting caught up in how you feel and going out on dates and having fun in the time of your life. I think if you're dating well, you're doing those things, but as you're hanging out, you're going on dates, you're meeting up with groups of friends, you're taking them to meet your family. As you're doing that, you're evaluating, does this person fit into my life? Is this person someone that I potentially wanna get married to? What do they look like? Who are they really? So it's a process of evaluation. And what are we evaluating? Is this a person that I would want to marry? Now, throughout this series, guys, this is not a series on dating advice. Like if you're looking on just like, okay, man, I just wanna know, how to get a boo. You know, like that's, I promise you, um, there are way better people you can get advice from than me, okay? I don't have good dating advice, but what we wanna do is we wanna look at scripture, we wanna look at the Bible and see what does the Bible have to say. Now, I gotta be honest with you, there's not a lot in the Bible about dating specifically. There's no part of like Genesis that's like an Adam slid unto D, uh, Eve's DMs, you know, and said, what's up, girl? Like, there's no, there's no, method of, of, of dating in the Bible like, like what we have today, but you know what there is? The Bible says a lot about how we can treat each other. The Bible says a lot about how we can analyze people around us to see who do we want to invite close into our life, and the Bible says a lot about how we can become the person that God created us to be, and so that's what we're going to ultimately focus on, and so what should we be looking for? What should we be looking for? And, and the last thing I want to say before I jump into our four ideas tonight is, um, I was thinking about this even just earlier this morning. I added this in. Um, you know, I'm a, I'm a sports guy. Um, I don't play sports, like, yeah, as you can tell us. But um, I, I love watching sports, and uh, I love them all. I love football. Like, I get real into football. Then, like, the next day I'm watching tennis, and I'm going just as hard. So I love sports. And, and you know, most, like, team sports have this time of year 
where um, they will draft players. Or they're like, okay, we need to add new players to our team. It's a whole thing and process. The NFL has like a three-day long draft system. And, and I was, I, these are some things that I already knew, but I was reading up about this. And the, the evaluation and scouting process of an NFL athlete, someone that a team wants to draft, is absolutely insane. And what I read this morning was that basically what they'll do is um, some of these teams know for not just months, but maybe even a year or years that there's a certain player that they have their eye on. And so they'll start, they'll start scouting them. They watch game film. They will watch practice film. They'll then invite these guys in. They do a combine. Many teams will invite these guys for like a private visit. They measure like their wingspan. They see how high they can jump, how fast they can run, how many times can they bench press 225 pounds. And, and they're doing all this stuff. They interview them. They make them go through IQ tests. They will interview their parents, and they also will interview close friends, people that are around them, because they know that the people that this guy keeps around him is gonna be a good indicator of what he values, right? And so they, I mean, they go through the craziest evaluation process, because they know, man, we've gotta get the right people, and we've gotta get great players if we're gonna have success. And then it kind of hit me this morning while I was thinking about it, and it blew my mind that you have, you have sports teams and franchises that will put that much effort and scouting and evaluation into somebody that they wanna to add to their team, yet we won't put near that amount of evaluation and scouting into who we wanna add into our life. Like, I'm gonna hitch my life to you, and I barely know you. You know, like, we should date, we should be boyfriend and girlfriend, and I'm like, man, there's a, there's a better way to go about this where we can truly know who we're dating before we ever start actually dating them. It's a better way to go about it. And so, four things tonight, um, they got this good alliteration. They all start with the letter C. It's gonna be great. So four things tonight. These are kind of like pillars, not exhaustive, but I think these are four great things to be looking for um, when you're scouting, when you're evaluating. Is this somebody that I would maybe be interested in or want to date? The first one is this. Number one is Christ. That's the first thing that you wanna look for. Do they have the pillar of Jesus Christ in their life? Do they follow Jesus um, and the reason that I wanna put this first is because I think this, I believe this with all my heart, that if we don't get this right, then the rest of what I say tonight and the rest of what I say over the coming weeks, it doesn't matter. If we don't get this first part right, if you are somebody who says, I follow Jesus, I am a Christian, and you're looking for someone to date with the, with the intent of, of marriage, then I think the very first thing you have to look at is, do they follow Jesus Christ? Now, the thing that I wanna point out is that this should not be something that you have to work to figure out. You shouldn't have to become a private investigator to find out, do they love Jesus? Like, I gotta look at all their bios, I gotta like check to see their, their last tweets from the last year. It shouldn't take a lot of digging to find out if somebody truly is a sold out follower of Jesus Christ. It should be obvious and it should be something that you notice. You should notice it on them, that they, they walk differently, they act differently, they talk differently. When they do open their mouth and talk, you hear them talk about Jesus, you hear them talk about the things of God. If you go on a first date with someone and for the entire day, not one thing comes up about God, can I tell you this? I don't think that God would be as big of a priority in their life as they might would, would tell you that he is. The Bible says from the abundance of your heart, the mouth speaks. So if you wanna know what somebody values and what's in their heart, listen to what's coming out of their mouth. It should be obvious. You don't have to dig for these things. And so we should notice it. And the Bible is really clear, guys. The Bible is so clear that as Christians, we should link up and we should date and we should partner our lives with people who follow Jesus. We should not link up with people that don't. Second Corinthians chapter six, uh, starting in verse 14, says this. And I love this, Paul so emphatically, he's saying, don't team up with those who are unbelievers. Now you might know this, this verse more commonly uh, refer, referred to as, do not be yoked together with unbelievers. He's saying, don't yoke together, don't tie yourself together, don't team up. How can righteousness be a partner with wickedness? How can light live with darkness? What harmony can there be between Christ and the devil? How can a believer be a partner with an unbeliever? And what union can there be between God's temple and idols? For we are the temple of the living God. He's saying, don't, don't tie yourself, don't yoke yourself, don't cuff yourself together with someone who is an unbeliever. Now, I wanna do something real quick that honestly might be a little weird, so we're gonna go for it. But um, I actually need, can I get two volunteers? I just need like one guy and one girl, okay? I mean, I just use you. Can I just, can I pick people? Is that cool? Can I pick you? Will you come up, Vanessa? And then right here with the, like the cutoff, will you come up? Is that cool? Okay, give these guys a huge hand. 
You don't have to say anything, I promise. Okay, here's what I want us to do. Will you go ahead, <laughs> will you put this on your, your right wrist? Go ahead and put that right there. Okay, we'll see, okay. Um, and then go ahead and put that on your left. There we go. Okay, it's cuffing season, guys. Okay, there we go, okay. So, uh, what's your name? Josh. Josh, what's your name? Vanessa. Vanessa, Josh and Les Vanessa, do you guys know each other? No, okay, do you wanna know each other? No, I'm kidding, okay, so. Just messing. Okay, so Josh and, and Lanessa. So for this illustration, Lanessa, you're going to uh, demonstrate somebody who's a follower of Jesus Christ, okay? And Josh, unfortunately, um, you're not following Jesus, okay? So here's what we do, okay? And this is why I think Paul, when he talks about this idea of being, being tied, yoked, linked, cuffed together, he's saying don't cuff yourself to somebody who is an unbeliever, right? Because if, if you're a Christian, I want you to really think about this. If you're a believer, you're saying that my allegiance in life is to Jesus Christ. Now, somebody else who's not a Christian would say that my allegiance in life is not to Jesus Christ, it's to other things, it's to the things that I can have and the things that I can get in this world. Now, here's where this gets tricky. Your allegiance will ultimately determine your alignment, okay? And then, and then here's the thing, your alignment will ultimately determine your direction. So if you wanna go back, your allegiance, if you have different allegiances, you will end up going in different directions. And so here's what ends up happening. We have people that link themselves together, maybe out of a good heart. They're like, oh my gosh, like he's, I know he's not a believer, but he's really, he's honestly, he's so cute. He's like, he treats me well, he's got money, you know, or he's like, she's so beautiful, like we gotta link together. And, and so your allegiance and your alignment and your direction is going that way and your allegiance and direction is taking you that way. So this is gonna hurt a little bit, so don't do it too hard, but pull apart for a second. So what ends up happening is if we cuff together with someone who doesn't have the same values and isn't going the same direction as us, when we go in opposite directions, all we do is create tension. And so if you want a marriage, you guys can come back together. If you want a marriage and you want a life that's full of tension, then as a believer, go and date somebody and marry somebody who's not a believer and you will have a life and a marriage full of tension. You know, the, the statistics tell us that you have just under a 50% chance of getting a divorce when you get married. Just under 50%. Now, I read this in a New York Times article that if, if you have a, a strong faith and you marry someone who, who has, uh, has a different faith than you or no faith at all, the New York Times said that you actually have a 70% chance of getting a divorce in that relationship. So the odds are already bad, and the question that I would ask is why in the world would we wanna make them worse? Why would we wanna make them worse? Okay, you guys can go ahead and head back to your seats. And No, I'm just messing with you. So <laughs> you now have to sit next to each other. Let me just pull up here, I think. Go ahead. Right there. I don't know. Actually, you're stuck. Okay. How's it? <laughs> Let's go. Here, pull there. I'm going to have them help you. Oh, there it is. Okay. I was like, he needs help. Thank you. Hey, give these guys a big hand. Give these guys a big hand. So, I think I said this last year when I was talking about the same idea. For me, if, if you're a Christian, you're saying, guys, Jesus is the most important thing in my life and you link up with somebody who's not, do you realize that, that much of your life, you guys are gonna be in total disagreement on how to make big decisions for your life? What are you gonna do with your Sunday? What are you gonna do midweek? What are you gonna do with your money? Because a lot of Christians are like, man, I wanna be generous. These Christians love to give back into the church. And imagine if you're married to somebody that's like, wait, you're gonna give some of our money back to that place? How are you gonna raise your kids? Are your kids Christians or are they not? Are, your kids gonna, are you gonna pray over your kids at night or, or are you gonna not? When your kid comes home and they're broken, are, are, are you gonna pray for them or do we say, ah, that's just not what we do in this house? And I'm telling you, the, the thing that you love the most and value the most, you won't even be able to share with the person that you love the most. And so we don't wanna live like that. You don't wanna create a life of tension. And so if you come up to me at, at YA, whether it's tonight or any night after service and you're like, hey, uh, I just wanna get a little bit of relationship advice from you, you know, I'm having a little bit of trouble, you see my, my boyfriend or, or my girlfriend, um, they're not a Christian, I immediately know two things. So if you meet me here and you say something about your relationship and you say they're not a Christian, I immediately know two things about you. The first thing I know about you is this, is you don't take your faith very seriously. And I know that sounds harsh, but I can say that with full conviction in my heart. I know that for a fact. Because if you take your faith seriously, then you will date seriously and you will make sure you're dating somebody that has the same alignment in Christ that you have. And so I know that you don't take your faith very seriously. You cannot say Jesus is the most important relationship in my life, yet leave him out of the second most important relationship in your life. And then the second thing that I'll know about you 
is that you're not gonna like the advice that I give you. Because you're like, so what do I do? I'm gonna say, break up with them. That's all I'm gonna say. All right, I don't have any advice to give you at that point. It's really quiet because everyone's like, oh my gosh. Like that's, but that's just the reality. Because I don't have advice to give you at that point. Right? I don't, I don't, I'm not gonna be like, you know what? Let's just, let's just keep dating. We'll figure this out. Um, you know, maybe someday. Maybe someday they'll come to Jesus because that's what a lot of people think. They're like, but like, you know, I'm trying to bring them to church because maybe someday they might become a Christian. Now, would you look at me for a second? Guys, dating is not a good evangelism strategy. It's not a good one. It's not a good one. We call that missionary dating and we call that flirt to convert and it doesn't really work very well. I rarely see that work out. And so that's what a lot of people do and they, they, they don't understand that if you claim to be a follower of Christ, then you have to make a decision that I will not date someone who doesn't follow them. And, and I'm, I'll even take it this far. I'm saying, guys, like don't even go on dates with someone who doesn't follow Jesus. Don't even get the ball rolling. Don't allow yourself to even get there. And you're like, well, this sounds harsh, bro. Jesus hung out with non-believers. Yes, but Jesus wasn't trying to marry them. Okay, like, you know what I mean? And when people got around Jesus, they typically changed. And so there's, there's a, a greater picture to all of this. And, you know, I, I know for some of you guys, this is pretty straightforward. And, and I know some people, they, they're pretty outward about the fact that they don't believe in God. Like, I'm not a Christian. I don't even believe in God. And so it's one thing to date someone like that. But I think for a lot of us, when we're dating people, there's part of that evaluation that's like, okay, they say they're a Christian, but are they really a Christian? Have you ever met a Christian that wasn't a Christian? I've met some. You might be here. No, I'm kidding. But like, I've met some of them in my life, right? Somebody who said, I follow Jesus, but in all reality, they don't. Or men, I follow Jesus, and, and they, they don't love people. Like, you, you see it happen all the time. And so sometimes it's really obvious, but sometimes, again, this is why you're evaluating, when you're looking at this person, okay, that you maybe you met them here at YA. That's a good starting point. But just because you met them here doesn't mean they're a great person. Just because you found them in a church doesn't mean they're a Christian. Just like standing in the garage doesn't make you a car. Okay, so you have to understand that. It's a great starting place. This is a better place to meet someone than the bar or the club or Tinder. I can guarantee that. But it's not perfect. And so when you meet somebody, you still got to evaluate. Don't just go, I met them at church. Praise God. That's good. But evaluate. Do they, do they, are they really sold out? Maybe they worship real big here, but maybe you hear nothing about God for the other six days of the week. Evaluate what is this person really like. The second thing tonight is character. Everybody say character. Character. So who, who are they really? Who are they deep down? Who are they? I love asking like this. Who are they when no one else is around? Or who are they when only you are around? Right? What kind of character do they, do they have? What kind of integrity do they have? And I, and I love both of those ideas and those words, and character and integrity. And uh, if you guys will let me, I kind of want to jump to the idea of integrity for a moment. I chose character because they all start with C, and I know there's type A people in here tonight. But I want to talk about integrity uh, for a second. And, and integrity is defined like this. If you guys want to put this up on the screen, integrity is soundness of moral character or honesty. Okay, that's probably the main definition a lot of us would think of. The second one is not as common, though. Integrity is the quality of being whole and complete or one. You know, what I love about this is that when you read the Old Testament and you see the word integrity, the Hebrew word for integrity actually doesn't mean soundness of moral character. It means the second definition. So anytime you're reading the Bible, you're reading Proverbs, and you see integrity, it means quality of being whole, completeness, or one. So here's what I want to get at. Okay, this is so simple, but I, I really do think it's profound. When we say that somebody has integrity, we're saying that that person is one. What do I mean by that? I mean that that person is not two, okay? I know that's so simple. What do I mean by that? Have you ever met somebody that was two-faced or two-sided or acted one way at church in a completely different way when they weren't here? And so when someone has a lack of integrity, basically what it means is that they're not the same person in every environment that they go to. And so we, we look at integrity as, oh, well, they just have good standards and good character and, and good morals, but I want you to look deeper at it for a moment. And understand that as you're dating and evaluating, if you look at somebody and you see they act different around different people. Like they act one way here at YA, but they act a completely different way when it's just me with them alone. They act this way around these friends and this way around these friends. They, they say this, but they actually live like this. Guys, that is a major lack of integrity, right? That's a, that's a fractured life. There's a crack in their soul and in their spirit, and there's a duplicity to their life. I love Proverbs 11.3. It says this, the integrity of the upright guides them, but the unfaithful are destroyed by their duplicity. 
And so I love that integrity and duplicity are kind of pitted against each other here. These are, these are uh, integrity versus duplicity. They're antonyms here in this moment. And I think the writer of Proverbs is trying to show us that if there's a duplicity to someone's heart, to someone's life, then that person doesn't have integrity. And ultimately, that's going to come crashing down. You know, I was doing some research, and I found that uh, the word integrity is actually used a lot in, in construction. And I had to read about this because I know nothing about this. The, literally, the only things I've ever built are, like, the kids' furniture in my kids' room. And I put it together, and it took four days. But um, in, there, there's this idea in, in construction, this, this concept of integrity, or they call it structural, structural integrity. And basically, what that means is they'll go and analyze and evaluate a building and as they evaluate it, they look at the foundation, they look at the, the foundational pillars and columns of the building, and what they're looking for are, are chunks that are taken out, pieces that are missing, or cracks in the foundation or in the pillars. And if the building is free from all of those things, they'll say this building has structural integrity, and what that means is that they believe that building can hold its own weight as well as the weight of other things and other people. That's a structurally integrous building. Now, if it has pieces missing from its foundation, or if it has cracks in some of the, the you know, load-bearing walls or pillars, they look at that building and say it doesn't have structural integrity, and oftentimes they'll call it condemned, and that building sometimes um, will have to be vacated, sometimes it's demolished, but ultimately what they know is that because of these cracks in the foundation, eventually this building is gonna come crashing down. And so we have to get people away from it so nobody gets hurt when it does. All this I wanna say is this, when it comes to the foundation of someone's life and, and who they are as a person, if you see cracks in who they are, you have to understand that at some point, whether in the near future or in the distant future, their life is going to come crumbling down and you don't wanna be around when it does. You don't wanna be there. In a moment where you're seeing cracks in someone's foundation, where you're seeing a duplicitous nature to someone and they don't have integrity and you're watching them make decisions that you're, you're looking back like, I don't, I don't like what I just saw there. I don't like that kind of decision. I don't like this dual nature of this person. I'm telling you, that's somebody that you wanna run as far away from as possible. Don't marry someone like that. This is, this is the, the people that will say late in marriage, and I got married to somebody, thought they were great, but after we got married, man, they, they became somebody entirely different. That's when this was somebody that wasn't looking for the cracks in the foundation, right? Because if they can hide these things while dating, there are things that they won't be able to hide five years into marriage, and you're going to start to see who they really are. So evaluate. Look, is there a lapse of integrity? Because I believe a small lapse in integrity now can lead to a total collapse in that relationship later. You want to look for these things. What do they have? I, I was reading this. this is the, one of the last things I'll say, and I'll move on. But um, I was reading an article about a Fortune 500 company, and this kind of blew my mind. They had this employee um, handbook, and in the handbook, they were saying, uh, about you know, all the things they wanted employees to do and things to know and things to remember. And they got to this idea of integrity. And in this employee handbook, they literally said this, we don't coach integrity violations, we fire them. They're like, look, if you're struggling, you mess up a couple times, you're not hitting the, the numbers or the marks, like we'll help you, we'll coach you. But if you violate integrity, we're not gonna coach you, we're gonna fire you. And I wonder how many people are in, are in relationships where integrity has been compromised, and rather than fire that person and break up and walk away, you're trying to coach them through it. But I just wanna tell you guys tonight, if there are major lapses in integrity, don't coach through it, walk away from it. You don't wanna carry that with you for the rest of your life, and I'm telling you, small bits of, of a lack of integrity now will turn into bigger things later, and that's what Luke 16, 10 says, whoever is faithful with very little will also be faithful with much. But whoever is dishonest with very little will also be dishonest with very much. I want you to keep that in mind because it might seem like something small now, but the small issues and sins and lapses of, of integrity ultimately turn into bigger things. And so watch for those things in your life. The third thing tonight that I want to talk about that I want us to look at as another thing to look for in a pillar is chemistry. Everybody say chemistry. Man, we got to have Chemistry, so you wanna live out your, your years with someone who's not only faithful to God, but you wanna live out your years with somebody who's a, a good fit for you. Like if you can find somebody that has godly character and good chemistry, like that's a good thing. I heard it said like this one time, that character is boring without chemistry, but chemistry falls apart without character. And so you don't just want one or the other, right? Some of you like ladies in here, you're like, man, I just, that guy, like I don't find him very attractive, but he's a great guy. And that's awesome. That's, that's one piece of it, but you still have to make sure, man, do we have 
Chemistry. Is there, are there things that we like about each other? Um, chemistry is, is defined as this in this context. Chemistry is reaction between two people. Reaction between two people. So when two people come together, when two people mix, what is the reaction that takes place? And that is ultimately chemistry. Um, I don't know, this is really random, has nothing to do with the sermon, but the other night we were at our youth ministry and after service, um, some of our students were like dancing with these speakers that just bump music and there's like usually like six of them over there and they're just going. Like there's no one can watch, no one can see them. So they're dancing their heart out. And my niece was over there, her name's Avery. She's like, she's dancing away with her friends. And this, uh, I, I noticed that there's this boy over there and he's like dancing next to him. You know, he's just like going in, like living his best life. And then he runs over to me, he's like, bro, he's like me and your niece, he's like, we got chemistry, bro, we got chemistry. And I look above his head over to her and she's like, no, we don't, like we don't. And I just love that, I love how he just swung and missed. Like he was going for the fences and I'm proud of him, I really am. But he's like, he's like, man, we got chemistry. And she's like, we don't. Um, so anyway, so they might be a great man, they might be a great woman, they might be awesome. But, but ultimately, the, the question then becomes after that, but do you like them? You know, do you get, do you, do you get along with them? Do you, is it fun, is there romance, is there excitement? Because some people honestly just don't mix. Like you put water and oil in the same container, they're in the same space, but it just doesn't, it doesn't mix. And I think a lot of relationships are like that. I, I was thinking about um, in college, I went on a date um, with this girl, and um, I won't tell you her name, but it uh, started with Megan. And so I went on a date with this girl, and uh, she's not gonna watch this. Like, where even are you? So um, I, met her at, I met her at Christian College. So I looked at this girl, and I was like, she's kind, she's cute, like you're way cuter. She's kind, she was, she was cute, and she was a Christian. And I was like, okay, that's all you need. So I went on the date with this girl, like fully expecting, I'm at a Bible college, like I'm studying to be a pastor, like this is just gonna, it's gonna work, it's gonna be easy. And so we go on this date, I take her to dinner, and I just wanna tell you guys, like I have never been that bored and miserable in my entire life, never. And, uh, I'm sitting there talking to her, and I'm, I'm doing everything I can. Like, I'm asking questions. I'm just, like, going in. How did you get to Bible college? Like, what do you feel like God's calling you to do? And she would answer the question, like, shortly, but then wouldn't ask me a question back. And I was just like, okay. So I'm, like, I'm exhausting everything. I'm getting to the point at the end where I'm like, do you like toast, too? You know, like, I have nothing left to ask her. And I remember this so, so vividly. Somehow at the end of the conversation, and, and again, maybe I just got, I exhausted everything I could think of, and Somehow, in the, toward the end of the conversation, we got on the topic of Harry Potter. So, again, this is 10 years ago, like in the height of like the sixth and seventh movies coming out, and, and I'm a Harry Potter. Does anybody like Harry Potter? Let's talk about this in church. Big fan over here. Okay. Who doesn't like Harry Potter? Okay. You're dismissed. So, so Harry Potter comes up, and all of a sudden, she lights up. And I'm like, oh, okay, personality. Let's see. And so, she lights up. And now, let me just say this. She might have thought the same thing about me. I'm not that naive. Like, she could have been like, this guy sucks. Like, so, but she lights up. And I'm like, this is great. But then all of a sudden, I didn't realize what was coming. She launches into this, like, 14-minute dissertation, this speech about how Harry Potter is witchcraft and of the devil, and he's also a bad influence on children. And I was like, honestly, he does, like, rebel against his teachers all the time. But, like, she just starts going in. And I was, like, sitting there, and I literally just was, like, laying on the table, like, God, please get me out of here. Like, I need to go. And in my head, I'm nodding. And in, like, in my mind, I'm just like, like, you're cute, but I don't like you at all. I don't want to, like, you know, and I know that sounds so mean, but I was, I was so bored. And, and, I, and I, the only reason I bring that up is just to show you, like, there was no chemistry. And, and I want you to understand that just because you're, somebody's nice and they're cute or they're good looking and you're in the same space together, it, it doesn't mean that that's somebody that you should date or somebody that you need to date. You want to, there's got to be a chemistry involved. Like there was such a difference and God bless her, she's a great girl, I don't wanna like bash her, but I, I went on a date with my wife and immediately on that first date, like I just felt something different. Like it was awkward, we went and had sushi together and so the best part was we would like shove a whole bite of sushi in our mouth and have like 30 seconds of silence, but it was funny, okay, we laughed, chemistry, it was there. So, but do you, do you have chemistry? Now, well I have a few examples, I want us to make sure that, that we understand what I'm talking about with this because there's a lot of different types and, and I, as you're looking at someone or in a relationship, um, do you have these types of chemistry? So the first one I wanna ask you if you have is, do you have relational chemistry? So when you're with someone, do you like each other? I keep talking about this, but is, do you like each other? Do you get along? Is she or, or he someone that's interesting to me? Do you look forward to hanging out with them? Do you just wanna be around them? Do, is there an ease to your conversation? Is there a relational 
chemistry between you and that person. And so like, I know that sounds so obvious, but I'm telling you, I've watched people date and I'm like, why are you dating? Like this just looks, I, I don't feel like either of you are having a good time and I feel like they feel forced because the other person is kind. They're nice and this is just how it's ultimately gonna be. And uh, the other type of chemistry, do you have social chemistry? Socially. Um, let me just say this. If you get into a relationship and a few months into that relationship, you no longer have any of the friendships you had prior to getting into that relationship, that's a bad relationship. So what happens a lot of times is the girl's like, I don't like your friends. Or the guys like your friends, they annoy me. I don't want to be around them. And so what we'll do is they'll, they'll get rid of their friends thinking, you know, well, this is the most important person in my life, so I just need them, right? And I'm telling you, if, if you bring someone into your friend groups and they don't like anybody that you're closely associated with, they don't care for your family, I'm telling you, the problem is not with every one of your friends and your family. The problem is with that person. And we've got to get to a point where we go, okay, I like you. I might even say I love you. I think you're great. You're beautiful. We're, we're relationally compatible. We're compatible on so many levels, but if, if you can't love my friends and if you can't love my family, then this isn't going to work. The Bible wants you to have great romantic relationships, but the Bible also mandates that we have great friendships. You cannot leave your friendships behind for a romantic relationship. And if you've done it, honestly, get on the phone tonight and call your friends and just say, look, I've been an idiot. Like, I'm sorry. Like, I wanna work to make things better. And I'm telling you, this happens more often than we realize. And so do you have social chemistry? Um, do you have entertainment chemistry? Now, I know this sounds weird, but what do, you, what do you enjoy and what do you like to do for fun? Now, you might end up with somebody that's um, very different from you are. My wife and I, you cannot get two different people. But one of the, the best things about us, I believe, is that we don't like everything the same, but there's a lot of things that we enjoy together. And when you're dating someone, analyze that and evaluate. Like, okay, we're different, but do we enjoy some of the same things? Because if, if everything you bring up is like, this is what I love, this is what I'm passionate about, this is what I enjoy, and they don't like any of it, and you decide to continue in that relationship to marriage, that means someday when you're out trying, the, the, the greatest moments and the greatest enjoyment you're gonna have in your life is either gonna have to be without that person or with you dragging that person along and they don't wanna be there. You wanna have to, I know that sounds like so basic, like that's not spiritual. It's honestly not that spiritual, but it's really practical. Do you like some of the same things? Like, oh my gosh, I love camping. She's like, I hate camping. Or the other way around, you're like, okay, like strike one. No, I'm kidding. But like, but just make sure. Make sure there are things that you guys love. Do you enjoy the same types of things? And what I love about being married to my wife is that we're, we're friends. And as we go somewhere and if we travel somewhere, it's not spent the whole time fighting and arguing over where are we gonna go and what are we gonna do? There's an ease to it. And we often are going in the same direction already. Um, so do you, have, do you have entertainment chemistry? Do you have spiritual chemistry? Just spiritual chemistry. Like, that's a weird one. You know, like, do we raise our hands together at the same moment of every worship song? You're like, oh my God, she's the one. Like, you know, like, I don't mean like that. That would be really cool. Like, that might, that might be God. But, um, but do you have spiritual chemistry? Um, do, not only do you both believe in God, but do you believe similarly about God? You don't wanna have a bunch of your fights in, in your life and in your marriage about different nuances, about theology and doctrine. Is, is there a chemistry about even what you think about God? Is, do you guys like the same kind of church? Are you here tonight, but the person you date isn't here? Because they're like, I, don't, I hate that place. I don't want to be there. Do, do you guys enjoy the same kinds of, in, of environments and communities of God? And then the last one would be, do you have physical chemistry? Do you have physical chemistry? Are you attracted to them? Right? Do you look at them and you're like, man, she's beautiful. Man, he is attractive. He's handsome. You want to have that physical attraction? You want to have that physical chemistry? We'll talk about this in a few weeks. So here's the thing. You don't have to test out whether you have physical chemistry or not. Just want to throw that out there real quick, Right? Some of you guys are like, yeah, we got chemistry. I'm like, you might know a little too much, but you can tell if you have physical chemistry. You don't have to test that out. You don't have to test the waters on that. So do you have chemistry? And the fourth and final thing tonight, number four is control. Control. Uh, everybody say control. So here I, I don't mean controlling, and I don't mean control of you. If you're dating someone controlling, again, something that you want to get out of. But what I want to look at here is, do they have control of them? Do they have control of themselves? Does he have control of himself? Does she have control of herself? The Bible has so much to say about self-control um, and, and what it looks like. And, and we don't even have to necessarily look at the Bible to, to know this. You can look at life and you can look around you. When, when there's a girl or there's a guy that you're dating that lacks self-control, what's on the other side of that is, is never good and it's never enjoyable and it's not something you wanna be around. You know, I'm thinking about a, a girl, does, does she have self-control? Is she angry all the time? 
Does she, does she lash out? Does she control her actions? Does she control her words? Or does it just come out? Does she say the meanest things to anybody? Does she say to you? So does she have self-control? You look at a guy, does, does he have self-control over his mind? Does he have control over the lusts of his eyes, the lusts of his flesh? Does he have control over his body? Um, are you always afraid that he might hit you? Does he have control of his anger? Does he have control of his words? Um, I look at the Bible, and Proverbs tells us a lot about this idea. Proverbs 25, 24, might be one of the funnier scriptures in the entire Bible, um, but it says this. It says, it is better to live alone in the corner of an attic than with a quarrelsome wife in a lovely home. Now, what I want you to understand with this is, this is not just picking on women. Like, because honestly, every guy in here, like at some point in our life, like you deserve to be nagged. I'm just gonna let you know right off the bat. Like you deserve it. You had it come in. Like we're, we're not always the smartest. This isn't talking about a wife that's just getting onto her husband on occasion or, or they're arguing at times. It's talking about a quarrelsome woman. Like this is how she is defined. And maybe you're dating one, maybe you know one, maybe you've seen one before. But have, have you ever seen um, a girl, have you ever seen a woman that just has anger? Right, and it's, and it's like she lashes out. She lashes out at people. She lashes out at her friends. She lashes out at you. She can't control her tongue. And he says, look, it's, it's better to just be hiding in the attic, like in a scary place with cobwebs, than to live in a beautiful home with someone like that, because it's gonna be misery. Now you have to understand, this is not written to married men. Right, if you're married, it's too late, right? You're, go to the attic. But if, this is, this is written for men who are not married yet, to tell you, if you're dating someone who's quarrelsome and always looking for a fight and doesn't have self-control, then run away from that because no life that you build is gonna be a life that you wanna be a part of. Then it goes on and picks on the guys just four verses later and it says, a man without self-control is like a city broken into and left without walls. Like if a guy doesn't have self-control, he's basically like a man, like, like back thousands of years ago, the, the walls of a city were the strongest and most important part of a city because the walls would keep out what people didn't want to come in and they would keep in the things that they didn't want to go out. And so if a city didn't have walls, number one, it meant that they were already defeated and number two, it meant that they were not prone to attack from anybody from any of the surrounding areas and they wouldn't be able to keep in what they wanted to keep in. So this is a man that doesn't have self-control, that has anger issues, that doesn't have control of his mind or his eyes, um, a man that what we call would be like a neck problem. You know, if you're dating a guy, and every time he sees an attractive girl, like another girl, he just moves like that. Like, that's, that's a lack of self-control. And it's like a guy that doesn't have control over himself. He has no real protection in his life. He is vulnerable to attack from the enemy, and he can't keep in what needs to stay in. And so that's where you see this guy, and you never know what you're going to get. You don't know if you're going to get a guy who's angry, who's outbursting physically or verbally, or if you're going to get the guy that's really kind and loves you. So do you have a guy? Is this a man who has self-control? I'm telling you, you don't wanna be around a man that can't control his mind, his emotions, his actions. And that's when people end up getting in a, in a big mess. And you know, I, I kind of looked at it like this. I wanted to uh, give you guys one last uh, visual here, but um, I've got my like trusty Wex cup. Are you even New Mexican if you don't have an old beat up Wex cup? I don't think so. So this cup uh, full of water, okay. Um, here's the deal. This is gonna represent us. Every, every person, all of us, we are filled up with something. Okay, some of us are filled up with like lovely things, you know, and peace and, uh, you know, like the fruit of the spirit. Others of us, like we're full of rage and anger, you know, and bitterness and all these things, right? But we're all, we're all, we're all filled up to the brim with something. Here's the tricky part. In, in dating someone, we honestly do a really good job of only showing this outside part and hiding what's inside. Like you have to understand in dating, you're gonna get the best version possible of that person, at least for a while. And so like they're like honestly a terrible person or, like, or they, they have anger, they've got some issues, they've got some addictions, and, but they do a pretty good job of keeping it inside. You know, they're like dating you and they're like, oh my gosh, I love you. You know, and they're like holding everything tight and, and, and they don't want you to see what's really inside because they don't want you to know this, this is who I really am. And so we're so careful. We're the most cautious version of ourselves. Oh gosh, okay, so, but then I'm gonna invite my wife to join me right here real quick. And uh, I'm gonna give her permission to do this. But here's the thing, how many of you guys know that life is not always easy. How many of you would raise a hand and agree that life bumps you sometimes? So you might be dating and you might be like real cautious and showing like the best part of you, like you're putting on deodorant, like you're doing all the things that you normally, like you don't do. So you're showing the best side of you, but there's gonna come a moment in life where you get bumped. So I'm gonna give you full permission. I know you've been maybe wanting to do this, but if you just wanna like bump me, push me, go for it. So life, beautiful. 
Thank you. I appreciate it. Give her a big hand. So life, life's going to end up bumping you at some point or another. Maybe it's in the relationship. Maybe it's the result of conflict. Maybe an intense amount of stress comes over your life. You get a bad diagnosis for yourself physically or somebody that you love. School's stressing you out. You're in conflict with somebody. And so you might have been playing that game for a long time. And I, I really honestly, I fear for people. I hear this happen sometimes. I, I literally talk to couples who are about to get married and they've said something like this. We've actually never fought before. And my immediate thought is, oh no. Like you've never fought? Like no, like we love each other. And I'm like, okay, we're gonna, we got some demons down there somewhere that have not come out, right? Because if you've been dating someone for a year or a couple of years and you haven't seen conflict and you haven't fought, at some point somebody's not being honest and somebody's trying to keep everything down. Somebody's doing everything in their power to cover this stuff up. But I'm telling you, if you get married at some point, someday it's going to come out. And I think at some point in that relationship, you need to see and identify what's actually in that person because some people are amazing until you disagree with them. Some people are just incredible and so fun and they laugh a lot until you call them out on something. Some people are, are amazing until you disappoint them or until they're under a ton of stress. So I wanna tell you guys, don't get deep into a relationship and God forbid, don't marry somebody without seeing who they are in conflict and under stress. You need to see who they are in those worst moments. And if like, you're like about to get engaged with somebody and you haven't fought, like I say this sometimes, but like stage a fight. Just do something stupid. Like see what happens, okay? Like I've gotta see who you really are. Because what we are in, in peaceful times and in dating, guys, it's so easy to keep it covered up and keep it concealed. You wanna know who someone is when, when the boat gets rocky. You gotta know what comes out when they get bumped. And so do they have self-control? Is there a pattern in their life? As you evaluate, I want you to begin to look for patterns. Does he get angry a lot? When he's super mad in the car, is he, is he punching something? Is he punching the steering wheel? Because there may come a point now where he's hitting things, but there might become a point where he starts to hit you. Watch who they are. If they can't control anger in a car, if they hit something, that's not something you wanna be around. Can she control her words when she's upset? Does she just take it out on you? That's not something that you wanna be around your entire life. Are there patterns? Look for those patterns. And you can forgive somebody for something once. I think if somebody ever lays their hands on you or hits you, I don't think you have to forgive that. You can go, and you should, and we will help you if you need that. But I think that other things you can forgive, but look for patterns, and that'll show you I've gotta get out of this. And so if dating really is a, a period and a process of evaluation, let me ask you this question tonight. What are you seeing? What are you seeing? What are you evaluating? You know, honestly, um, I'm starting the series differently than we normally do because I'm talking about, you know, what are we looking for? But typically we'll talk about singleness or, or we'll talk about, you know, about you. Like, are, are you ready to date? And one of the things that I wanna make sure you understand is that as we're looking at these four things, you know, I bet we're all thinking about other people. And we're all writing this down in the context of, yeah, that's what I'm gonna look for. But before you go and look for those four things, I want you to ensure that you are those four things. That you follow Christ. That you're somebody that has character and has integrity and isn't living a duplicitous life. That, that you're somebody that's fun and somebody would have chemistry with, right? They're like, I'm working on myself and I'm trying to be interesting and I'm trying to make sure that I have something to offer and, and I have control. If you lack self-control and you know it, please don't get in a relationship. Pray and say, God, work on that in me. If you're not fully following Christ, please don't get in a relationship. If, if you don't have character and integrity, please don't get in a relationship because if you drag someone into your dysfunction, your dysfunction will multiply. They will not make it better. It will become worse. Don't drag somebody into that. The famous question that we love to ask is this. Are you the person that the person you're looking for is looking for? Don't ever get so caught up in thinking, man, that's who I want. That's who I need. Here's my list. They gotta be like this, but you're not those things yourself.